Amen. Well, good morning. It's good to be with you again. My name is Matt Paxson. If you're just joining us this week, you're in the middle of a three-week series that we've entitled Just Jesus. And the goal of these three weeks is to just simply lift up Jesus, strip away the pretense, and just lift him up. Last week, we explored the topic of faith. And what we showed was that faith is not just some abstract thing, but faith is belief or confidence or trust in someone, and that for us is Jesus. But we might be like the disciples in that we can have this gift of faith and not use it. So as the storms of life come upon us, we're not using it. Jesus asked them the very pointed question, where is your faith? And so if you missed last week, please go back and watch that. This week we're jumping into the topic of joy. Joy is something that I think is easily lost. How many of you here have ever sung the song, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart? Yes, yes. <laughs> and when we first find Christ, there's this newness and this freshness. And then over time, as life just kind of hits you hard, it's easy for that joy to slip away. And so this morning, we want to talk about the joy that we have in Jesus. Because as we look at scripture, joy is truly found in just Jesus. And so this morning, we're just going to lift him up. And I want to start by turning to Luke 24. So if you have your Bibles, flip there real quick. And so let me just tell you as you're flipping there, this, this race that the, the Greeks used to have. And it's a race just like any other race where, you know, you want to go as hard and fast as you can. And you want to cross the finish line. But here's the catch. The winner is not the first person who crosses the finish line. The winner is the person who crosses the finish line first with their torch still lit. And so as we explore the topic of joy, I want the joy of your salvation to be rekindled on the inside. I want you to remember what Jesus has done for you. And so if you're here this morning and your heart is, is just in a place where it's dull or you, life is beat at you a little bit and you're spread thin and you're tired or there's sin that's in your life that's kind of making it not possible to sense God's presence, I want all of that to change. I want the joy of your salvation to be there so that you can finish the race with your torch still lit. Now here's something that in the first service the deacons had to hold back Pastor Higgins when I made this comment. I made the comment that the cross, right, the cross of Jesus, the cross, isn't enough. It isn't enough. And I can even see him right there, his white knuckle in the seats. He's like, you better explain that. But the cross isn't enough. The cross isn't enough. Now don't miss what I'm saying. We need the cross. I love the cross. I'm thankful for the cross, but the cross isn't enough. Remember, he was crucified, buried, and then what? He rose again. So when you read the New Testament, here's something that you ought to write down and quiz your friends on. When the New Testament writers, when the stories are given of the early church standing up and preaching this good news that we have, do you know that only about 80% of the time did they mention the cross? Now, that's not to minimize the cross, of course. Don't mistake me. Only about 80% of the time would they focus in on the cross. But do you know this? 100% of the time, every time, without fail, they mentioned the resurrection. You see, what they were preaching was the resurrection gospel. They were saying that our Savior has forever defeated sin and death. And they were proclaiming that to everybody, saying, He's risen, He's risen, He's risen. And that gave them tremendous joy. And so we're going to focus in on what Jesus has done this morning. And so just open your heart, suspend disbelief just for a moment, and let the words of Scripture speak to you. So just in honor of God's Word, would you stand with me? So just stand with me. I'm just going to read Luke 28, or Luke 24, verses 1 through 8. Just let the excitement of this begin to set in, and then we'll explore Luke chapter 4. Here we go. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, remember Jesus was crucified on Friday. And so a few days later, 
Here come these women to the tomb where he was placed at. So they brought their spices with them that they had prepared. Verse 2. They found that the stone rolled away from the tomb. They went in but did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men, two angels, stood by them in dazzling clothes. So the women were terrified and they bowed down to the ground. And then I love this question that the angels asked them. Are you ready? Why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is not here, but he has been resurrected. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and rise on the third day. And they remembered his words. You see, this should shut the mouth of every critic. All they would have to do is prove that the body is there, and Christianity would have stopped in that moment. But from there, they couldn't. And so this ragtag group of disciples began to spread the message about the fact that he's risen. The joy began to spread. Yeah, you go through life storms. And we'll look at that a little bit this morning. But there's joy in the midst of it because he has forever defeated sin and death because he has risen. Amen? Amen. Father, give us your grace this morning. Lord, I know your, your children come in here as I do, as we all do just beat up sometimes by life. Especially those of us who have been with you for a time, have bent a knee years ago and declared you Lord of our lives. It's easy to get just into the rote, the, the habitual patterns of the faith and really forget the why behind the what. And so Lord, this morning, give us ears to hear and a heart that would be responsive. Restore unto us the joy of our salvation. You have defeated sin and death. There is victory in you and you alone. The grave does not have the last word. And this morning, we remember the resurrection. We are thankful for the victory in the resurrection. And so as your word has spoken, let it be sharper than any two-edged sword. Let it pierce our hearts and our souls cut out what you want to cut out, refine and mold us so that we could be used for maximum value for your kingdom. So we give you permission to move here in these moments. We let the guard down and we just say, Spirit of God, you are sovereign, not us. And so move as you will. Stir us. Make us angry or mad or happy or frustrated or stirred to action, but just don't Leave us the same. In these moments, we do pray. In the name whose name is above all names. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And all of God's children said, amen. You can be seated. Came across this story. Turn to Luke chapter 4. I came across this story a time ago of a bridal procession that was waiting to start. So everyone's in their place. It's a wedding. It's the big day. And it's silent. And one of the ushers is in the back. And he's just sitting back there. And he's trying to get the attention of the organist. So the organist would start playing the music so the bridal procession could begin. And so he, he's trying to get his attention. It's just silence. And so he starts, just claps his fingers a little bit. He's, ah, claps his fingers. No, no response. It's just silence. The organist is looking the other way. And then he's, he's like, oh. He's getting more frustrated because he's wanting the wedding, wedding to start. So he claps his hands. He's like, he's, ah. he's trying to get his attention. Still nothing, you know. And so out of frustration, he just yells the organist's name. He goes, Neil, Neil. And in that moment, collectively, all the people sitting out there jumped out of their seats and knelt down for prayer. <laughs> and I think sometimes our Christian faith begins to get like that. We just obediently do things and we don't know why we're doing what we're doing. And so as we unpack this this morning, the Spirit of God is going to speak in a mighty, mighty way because in Luke chapter 4, when Jesus comes on the scene, something powerful is happening. And it's easy if we just gloss over the words to just miss the significance of it. But let's read here with me in Luke chapter 4. <clears throat> and as we do, I think God's going to speak to us powerfully. Here we go. Ready? Starting in verse 14. Then Jesus returned to Galilee and the power of the Spirit 
and news about him spread throughout the entire vicinity. He was teaching in their synagogues, being acclaimed by everyone. Verse 16, he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. Now, let me pause there for a moment. Jesus grew up in Nazareth. And so could you imagine the setting as some of his playmates, some of the people he knew when he was young, heard about the fact that Jesus was coming back to town. Could you imagine the excitement building as they knew, well, this is Jesus from our hometown, who now everyone in the region is talking about because of all the miracles and the way that he teaches with authority. He's coming back here? Whoa! I mean, could you imagine that as people say, wow, I, I've still got a table. I still have a chair that Jesus the carpenter made while he was still here before he went off, right? I mean, there's this excitement building. And not only that, but it's also the teachers that would come to these synagogues were so boring and they would lay on rules and it was just the dead weight of tradition so every time they would go to the synagogue it would just be like oh what have i done wrong what rules do i need to remember now then they would just read the law now here's the law you can't walk more than you know this amount of distance on the sabbath and they would just go on and on and on but something different is about to happen here's jesus the word of him is spread throughout the entire vicinity we know him right he's coming back to teach and so imagine the excitement you better get there early. Why? Because if you don't, it's standing room only. It's that kind of thing, right? Okay, so let's watch what happens. As usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. Now, let me just pause there for a moment. As usual. Or in some of your translations, it'll say something like, as was his custom. You know, Jesus, as usual, went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. I just feel the nudge to, whenever I preach on this passage, to mention this. Because so many people I come across are just kind of Christmas Eve and Easter Christians. You know what I mean? You know the people that only show up on Christmas Eve and Easter, and then maybe sporadically here and there? Well, let me just say that that is a foreign concept in Scripture. As usual, he entered the synagogue. I think that's a great precedence for us as God's people to, as usual gather together on the Sabbath day for fellowship and for God's word being preached. And so I just give that to you as an example. If you have people in your life that you know that just show up periodically, as usual, Jesus would show up. But now watch this. This is going to get super good. Ready? So don't miss this. Okay, you ready? Verse 17. Imagine the scene. He's standing in the middle of the room. Everyone's watching him. All eyes are on him. And then the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and he found the place where it was written. Now watch, he's quoting Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, to a Jewish ear who was trained in the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, when they heard that phrase, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor in verse 19, that would have meant something to them that was so powerful. Because they knew that in the Old Testament, our Old Testament, that God wanted to protect his, the poor people. And so the year of the Lord's favor was always the phrase that was given to protect the poor. And here's what it means. If you have a pen, take it out. Let me just give you these passages real quick. It meant three things, three things. The first one is Deuteronomy 15, 1 through 2. It meant that if you owed debt to anybody, every seven years, the debt was to be wiped off the books. Okay? So if you owed debt, if I owed money to you every seven years, Whatever money I owed, wiped clean. How many of you think that Visa and MasterCard should adopt the same policy, right? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so this is one thing when they heard in the year of the Lord's favor, they would have understood, oh, he's quoting from Deuteronomy. That means that every seven years your debt is wiped clean. Here's the second thing that it would, would have meant. It would have meant that if you were in slavery whether voluntary servitude or involuntary. If you were in slavery, you were to be set free. And this comes from Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 12. So every seven years, anybody who's a slave, set free. Doesn't matter how you got there, you're set free, okay? And here's the third thing that it would have meant. So the first thing is, 
that your debts are wiped clean. If you owed money to anyone, wiped clean. Second thing is, if you're in slavery, set free. The third thing is, from Leviticus 25, if you had land that you inherited and it was lost or you sold it for some reason, every 50 years, they called it the year of Jubilee, every 50 years that land or that inheritance was to be given back to you. Now you remember when the nation of Israel went into the promised land, God gave land to each of the tribes. And so if you were in a pinch and you needed some money, you might sell some land to somebody, but you knew that in 50 years or less than that, you'll probably get the land back. So if I sell it to you at year 30, it's a little bit more expensive than if I sell it to you at year 10, because in 10 years, that person's going to lose it. It's going to come back to me, right? So here's the three things. Your debts are wiped free. Your slavery is released if you're in slavery, and your inheritance is restored back to you. When the Jewish ear would have heard Jesus stand up in Luke chapter 4 and say, I'm proclaiming to you right now, they would have understood from the Old Testament those three things. But let me ask you a question. How many times do you think they ever practiced either of the seven-year releases or the year of Jubilee? How many times? Zero. Zero. Never, not once, did they ever practice those things. So here's Moses writing in Deuteronomy and Leviticus, and 700 years later, Isaiah in Isaiah 61 is lamenting the fact that they never practiced those things that God told them to do. So then hundreds of years later, here's Jesus coming on the scene, and watch what he says. Jesus says to them, let's just go back to verse 20. Jesus says to them, in your hearing today, right now, as you listen, the scripture is being fulfilled. Think how bold of a statement that would have been for people who were there. Jesus was saying to them, you could have never wiped away the sin debt that you had. You never even were able to set people free that were in slavery. You never could have gotten the inheritance back that you lost. You never celebrated the year of Jubilee. But what he's saying to them is this. Today, as you hear me speak, the scripture is being fulfilled. What is he saying? He's saying, are you in debt? I'll set you free. I will wipe everything clear. The debt that you could never repay, it's gone. Through me, it's gone. The slavery that you might have to your past, to your sins, to the guilt, to your life, to whatever, to the sins that would seek to bind us. You can't set yourself free. But today as you hear, this is Jesus, today as you hear, I will set you free. That inheritance that you first had, remember how man walked with God in the cool of the evening? Do you guys remember that from Genesis? Right? Could you imagine just chumming it up with God? You know, hey God, how was your day? You know, just in the cool of the evening walking with him. Then sin enters the picture. We're forever separated. Right? Well, we're separated at that point. And Jesus is saying, I'm restoring that inheritance. I'm reconciling God and man. And today, as you hear it, it is being fulfilled. So if you're here this morning and you just feel the guilt and the weight of sin, if you feel like you're in bondage to it, if you're a slave to it, who can set you free? Just Jesus. If you feel like you've got a debt load that you're just, wow, there's so much I've done wrong. There's so much. I, and God's called me to be over here, but I'm way over here. I need to be working and doing these things. There's so much that I need to be doing. Who can help you accomplish that? Just Jesus. If you feel like your inheritance, this relationship with God has been broken and never been restored, if you're here today and you've never bent a knee to declare Jesus Lord of your life, who can bridge the gap between God and man? Just Jesus. He is the only one. And so this morning we lift him up. He came on the scene and he declared, it's me. And so this morning I offer that to you. I don't know about you, but that gives me great joy in my heart as I think about what my Savior has done. He's defeated sin and death. He's made away. Isn't that good stuff? Okay, amen. All right, let me give you just a few quick observations that stick out to me as I read this and as I just think through a little bit of my experience as a pastor. So the first one is this. You guys know that you're born into a battlefield, correct? Isn't life sometimes tough, right? If you watch those late night televangelist preachers, turn those people off. It's not God owes you and it's not life will be roses. I mean, life 
can be tough at times because we're born into a battlefield. You guys are familiar with World War II? During World War II, 60 million people died. Think about that for a moment. 60 million people died. That was 3% of the world's population at that time. Imagine that, just gone. Well, you know, the war primarily happened in, throughout the 30s and into the mid-40s. Well, do you know this? When we invaded the beaches of Normandy in 1944, it was one year from that date until VE Day, which is when, you know, the, it was victory in Europe. It was when the war was over. It was one year. Do you know that the vast majority of people who died, 60 million, the vast majority of them died, not throughout the whole war, but in that one year period. Why? It's because Hitler, once we invaded, once we took the beaches of Normandy and, and we, we had a foothold in Europe, he knew that it was just a matter of time before we went from Normandy to Berlin. He knew that the war was pretty much over at that point. So what did he do? He had a scorched earth tactic. He said, okay, it's, I know it's a matter of time. It's going to go. Let it burn. And he just took as many people with him as possible and in, inflicted as much carnage as possible. Well, do you know that Satan is the exact same way? The war is already over. Jesus has already won the victory. Why? Because of the resurrection, right? He forever defeated sin and death. And so what's Satan's tactic now? Take as many with him as possible. Burn the whole thing down, right? And so I give this to you. I, I want to just declare reality. You already know it. I want to just declare it. You are in the midst of a battle. And if you don't put on the full armor of God, Ephesians chapter 6, I love preaching a sermon on Ephesians chapter 6, then, then you're not prepared for the coming day. And so as we talked about last week, you have to intentionally slow down to be able to experience God's grace and properly receive the equipment, the, the armor of God to fight the battle that you are in. You know, people will say things to me like this. They will say, hey Matt, I'm just trying to live the best life possible and I'm just doing YOLO. What does YOLO mean? Yeah, yeah, I didn't know it either until I asked Pastor Higgins. He's like, you only live once. I said, oh, okay. I'm just kidding. But you know how people have that mentality of like, oh, it's now or never. And, and what I say to them is this. I say that it's only possible to live the best life ever if you're on your way to hell. Think about that for a minute. For, for th those of us who are on our way to heaven, is, is this the best life ever? No, I mean, we want to live here and we want to do what God called us to do. And, and of course, we pray for his favor and things. But we understand that we're in the middle of a war zone. And that Satan is doing nothing more than plotting ways to take out God's people and to inflict as much harm as possible. There's a young man who lost his mother prematurely. It was unexpected. Nobody knew that it was going to happen. And the young lady had passed away. And the, and the young boy was just beside himself. And he didn't understand how to wrap his mind around it. And so one day he's walking into downtown city with his father, and it's a bright sunny day and they're walking along a sidewalk and as they're walking along, the son's just talking about his frustration and how it hurts and how he doesn't understand. And they make their way up to an intersection and as they're waiting there for the light to turn so they could walk across, a bus comes and it stops right in front of them. And as it stops in front of them, it casts this shadow upon them. And so the father thinks to himself, oh, here's a great object lesson. And so then the light turns for the bus, and the bus goes on, and, and, and as they work their way down the sidewalk, the father asks his son, son, did you notice that the bus shadow was on us when we were standing there waiting? And the son said, yeah. And the father said, did it hurt? The son said, no. And the father said, is there a difference between being hit by the bus and being hit by the shadow of the bus? And the son said, yeah, Definitely. And then the father said, that's exactly what the gospel message is. 
When you read back in Psalm 23, it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And he proceeds to tell his son, he said, what Jesus did for us is he got hit by the bus so that we only have to be hit by the shadow of the bus so that we could have life. And he begins to unpack the joy that we have in Jesus and how he made a way and how a goodbye is not goodbye, it's just until later. And so I leave this for you. I say that you are in the midst of a battle zone. And I just want to declare that reality. So it's nothing that churches go through ups and downs, just like you go through ups and downs, but we don't give in. We don't give in. We want to run the race so that we can finish with our torch still lit. Amen? Okay. All right, and let me give you just this one other thing. This would be a great practical application for you this week. I have a little son, and many of you have kids or you've worked with kids. When we teach our kids, we teach them this. We teach them to say, may I please have a cookie? And we give them the cookie, and then, it, and then when we give it to them, what do we do? We say, okay, what do you say? And they say what? Thank you, right? So in our economy, and the way that we do things as mankind, we say please, and then thank you. May I please have the cookie? Thank you. But do you know something? In God's economy, the way that God does things, it is completely opposite. You see, in God's economy, it's not please and then thank you. In God's economy, it's thank you and then please. Let that set in for a minute. In God's economy, you first approach his throne with thankfulness. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the breath in my lungs and thank you for this church and I thank you for my family I, and just go on and on. It's a heart of gratitude. And then once you've emptied out all of that gratitude, oh, Father, thank you. This is all from you and by you and for you. And once you empty out all that gratitude, then it's please. But you see, we get it the wrong way, don't we? We go before the throne and we're like, please. And then sometimes we come back and say thank you, but not always. And so my challenge for you this week is this, and I'll give the same one I gave last week. If this week you will slow down enough to let God speak to you, and you'll enter his courts with thankfulness first, and then your petitions and your requests second, everything will begin to change for you. Last week I gave the analogy that you're a car, and you're created to go 65 miles an hour down the road of life. Unfortunately, most of us go 90 miles per hour. We're going way faster than what we were created to go. But here's the rub, if you missed it. When God speaks, he speaks at 25 miles per hour. So if you want to hear from God, you've got to slow down. You were created to go 65, but you've got to go all the way back down to 25 miles per hour. And that means you got to lock the door or turn the radio off and just get away with you and God. And when you do that, if you will approach him with a heart of thankfulness and then a heart of request and petition, things will begin to change for you. Now, I'm not naive in this. There are days when my whole soul cries out to God and I feel his presence so strongly. There are days when I'm like, bless the Lord, oh my soul, you know, and I'm all ready to go. But then there are days when I can scarcely come up with an amen or an hallelujah. I just feel so worn and spent. Who's the one that can fill us? Just Jesus. Jesus. Who's the one that can release us from the sin that so easily ensnares us and enslaves us? Just Jesus. He's wanting to restore that relationship with you, but we just have to slow down enough 